With so many people building and buying computers again because prices have really kind of sort of returned to the realm of normal, we're gonna to talk today about five things that you should absolutely positively know are a complete waste of money when it comes to building and upgrading your PC. But first, speaking of money, I've gotta pay my bills, so roll it. For those looking for a high-end custom gaming experience, look no further than Falcon Northwest. Falcon Northwest has been building PCs made for gamers for over 30 years with a focus on a true high-end gaming experience. Custom cases available only through Falcon Northwest feature state-of-the-art testing and design to ensure that every component is performing at their best through thermal imaging and rigorous lab testing designed and overseen by the Falcon Northwest founder himself. With a complete lineup of systems ranging from small to large, every Falcon Northwest system includes a three-year warranty policy and a year of two-way overnight shipping coverage providing the ultimate peace of mind. To see all that Falcon Northwest has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. All right, so these are in no real particular order. Um, they kind of are, but not really. Just they, they are all completely interchangeable. The first thing I have on here that I came up with is completely oversized power supplies. You know, there's a... There's an old adage that people used to go by. When I say people, I mean old folks like me where like upgrading RAM might've gotten you a speed improvement or upgrading your power supply was somehow apparently gonna be better. Um, it's easy to overspec your power supply. Now you wanna leave some growth. You wanna leave some room for future upgrades where let's say you, you have a 60 series graphics card or like a 7600 XT AMD card or something like that. Yeah, you can get away with like a 500 watt power supply, right? But if you decide later on you wanna find a, you found a really good deal on like a used 3090 or something like that, which you know uh, is a 400 watt card, 300, well, about 350 watt to 400 watt card when it comes to overclocking or even custom models, then your power supply is not gonna cut it because you need a bigger one. But it's easy to go too big. So we've got an RM850X here and an RM1000X right here. And the price difference between these two can actually be pretty significant. Um, they're both gold rated power supplies. It's also extremely easy to overspend on your power supply by going a way higher 80 plus rating than you would ever need. So if you're running like really high end hardware, like 4090s that are overclocked and custom water cooling and overclocked 14900 Ks, which are huge gluttons for energy. Um, or let's even say like the new Threadripper stuff that's out that gets ridiculous amounts of performance with this 96 cores but also eats up like nearly a thousand watts plus for just the CPU, then yeah, you're gonna be looking at a high rated power supply, probably a 1500 to 1600 watt power supply, which is the biggest we can get in the US, by the way. I think in Europe, they can actually get 2000 watt power supplies because of their volt system versus ours. Um, you would never wanna put like a 1500 watt power supply on a basic PC. So do some research, find out how much power you really need for your system. There's calculators out there on like, um, I think uh, PC Part Picker even has a power calculator so you can put in your parts and it tells you what the recommended power supply size would be. And usually that in, builds in a little bit of extra growth. That way you have room for upgrades in the future without having to buy a whole new power supply. Fortunately, power supplies are something that can move along with you as your build matures, as long as you don't underspec it. But it's also very easy to accidentally spend 300 plus dollars on a power supply that you'll never even use 50% of its usage out of. So this next category is one that we all I think are guilty of sometimes going a little bit too crazy with, and that is our RAM and overspecking our RAM. RAM has three major categories to it, the capacity, the speed, and the timings. And all three of those can have a huge impact on your system. Now, if we're talking gaming systems, typically you do not need huge amounts of RAM. Some games and some titles can use a bit of system RAM, depending on how big the world is and how much the CPU is having to do work when it comes to that title. But for the most part, people can get away with like 16 gigabytes of DDR4 running at 3,800 megahertz and be perfectly fine for years to come. When DDR5 came out, it kind of started that race all over again. Well, how big can the modules get and how fast can they get? So now like the, the you can get eight gigabyte DIMMs with DDR5. They're actually rarer to find than 16 gigabyte DIMMs because that's kind of the new spec and the new JDAC standard. But 32 gigabytes for DDR5 is so much more than anyone would ever need for a gaming PC. Now the question is, do you need 5200 megahertz DIMMs, 4800 megahertz DIMMs, 8000 megahertz DIMMs? And if you go and look at the pricing between every time you step up, maybe four or 600, because it's, a, it's a usually increments of like 200 megahertz is where they tend to increase. The price difference between something like 5200 megahertz versus something like 7200 megahertz can often be double the price of the RAM. And more often what you'll find is the faster transfer rate of like 7200 megahertz sometimes has a slower CL or timing than something with slower RAM, but with a slower transfer rate. So sometimes for gaming PCs, you find it's better to have tighter timings than super fast RAM. 
But that, that's where a lot of people tend to get confused. So if you want me to do a video about gaming and timings and overall transfer rates versus timings, and then we're even talking binary and non-binary RAM these days, because now that we can get 48 gigs, 96 gigs, and all these other things, it includes a whole different level of complication when it comes to setting up your RAM. So if you want me to do a video about that, do me a favor, hit like on this video. But what I've got right here are actually two nearly identical sets of RAM. This is 5200 megahertz. It is also um, 32 gigabytes. This is 5200 megahertz and also 32 gigabytes. But the Nominator Platinum RGB is significantly more expensive than the Vengeance. That's because this, is their, this was their flagship RAM at the time. They've come out with new RAM since. This is just what I grabbed. But this has RGB lighting and it uses IQ and it has all the temperature feedback and it's got the nicer heat uh, sink on there. And for overall, it's just a better looking RAM. But in terms of performance between these two, if I were to have a like Pepsi challenge here, and have a system with a cover on it that you couldn't tell which RAM set was on there, you would never be able to tell the difference, period. But you can easily double the price by grabbing a set like this versus this. You gotta ask yourself, how much do these pretty little LEDs on top matter to you, at least in this particular instance, versus saving some money and having more to put into your overall build and maybe step up your graphics card or your CPU specs? Or just have more money back in your pocket at the end of the day knowing you got a good system that you didn't completely blow the the budget on. So this next one, I don't really have any like demonstration to show you here, but everyone knows what I'm about to talk about is just a complete fallacy. And that is gaming edition anything. Even a potato PC can be a gaming PC if you play a game on it. There's no such thing as a quote unquote gaming PC. There are PCs that are optimized for gaming meaning that the graphics card that's in there, uh, you know, it's gonna be fast enough to be able to turn your gaming settings up. But even a work PC can be a gaming PC, it just may not be great at it. But what happens is manufacturers have found about a decade ago, like, hey, if we put gaming on something, then the idiots will buy it. So that's where we started seeing like literally everything had the word gaming in the title. Now, more often than not, that gaming is nothing more than maybe a colorway or like a whole aesthetic look to it uh, or RGB. See, the first RGB stuff really was gaming. And that's when it had lights and stuff on it, but they weren't necessarily RGB. Like they might've had red lights or blue lights or they blinked or something, but you couldn't control them. They just had that sort of like a old Star Trek-y kind of look to it. Then RGB came out and that became the new quote unquote gaming. But even a, a so-called gaming monitor today is so ridiculous because gaming had the, the term gaming had to stay out ahead of the industry's baseline spec models. So what is a gaming monitor today is not the same as what was a gaming monitor 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, a gaming monitor typically was anything over 60 FPS. That's it, like TN panels, colors were absolutely terrible. It looked like you were looking at it through reflective foil. It was awful, but it had 120 Hertz or 144 Hertz refresh rate. It was 1080p and it had like a one millisecond response time. That's all people cared about, you know, but then as IPS monitors came out, they were slower. They had better color accuracy, but they were slower. You weren't getting them over 60 FPS. The response time wasn't great. Then the technology moved forward. So how did the whole term gaming stay ahead of that? 240 hertz panels, 300 hertz panels, 340 hertz panels. And now we got like 400 hertz panels. So that's really where the term gaming kind of stays ahead of the curve so that it makes you think you're actually getting something necessary for it, but you're not. So the, if you're shopping for anything and you see the word gaming in it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Just know that it's a kind of a bit of a marketing psychology trick, if you will, thinking that you're getting, oh, I wanna build a gaming PC, therefore there's the gaming model, I should get that one. When the base model right next to it will probably get you 95% of performance and features of whatever's quote unquote the gaming model. And this goes for graphics cards too. In fact, that brings me to my very next topic here, which is specifically going to be uh, custom PCB, high end, high tier graphics cards. So what I've got right over here are two RTX 3080s. This is a 3080 Founders Edition, which it's so cute by today's standards in terms of its size, but we know this thing is a, it's actually a pretty badass graphics card. It will run just about any game that you wanna run, 1440p or 4K, high settings, has good ray tracing. The, the, the performance was there. The cooling was there. Nothing was crazy about this card. It was a, it was a well-performing, didn't wanna melt itself card. And it retailed, uh, when it 
supposedly retailed for $700 brand new. This is the iGame GeForce RTX 3080 water-cooled graphics card. Doesn't necessarily say gaming on it, but it's their Neptune edition. It's their top of the line water-cooled card. And it was something like five or $600 more expensive than an RTX 3080. Putting it pretty close to what you could have gotten an RTX 3090 for. The thing was the price gap between the 3080 and the 3090 was $700 and $1,500. So it gave so much room for these manufacturers to come out with these custom models that could just slide up well over $1,000, $1,200, $1,300. But buying something like this for 1,300 bucks, that is gonna get you marginal improvement over even something like a Founders Edition card because of the fact that the, the silicon was only able to really be pushed so far. In fact, out of the box settings on this compared to a Founders Edition card would have probably run in the neighborhood of maybe 100, 100 megahertz faster. We are talking 5% difference. 5% difference is, you cannot tell 5% improvement from one card over another by staring at a screen without an FPS counter going. And that's where you start to realize you're throwing money away because of the fact that if you cannot tell by looking at it and just experiencing it that you're getting better performance, then that is by def definition a waste of money. Now what you will get with something like this that's water cooled and whatnot is you'll probably get longer life in terms of uh, keeping the silicon nice and cool. The cooler the silicon runs, the better the, the boost tables are gonna be but NVIDIA controls how far these boost tables are allowed to go, so they can't even boost up any higher than uh, any other custom card will be. It'll just hold those boost clocks longer if you live in a hotter environment or you know you have a long gaming session and heat soak starts to become a problem. But remember, these AIOs only touch the GPU die, like the RAM and the VRMs and all that. As that gets hot, that also has an uh, algorithm built into how the boost tables work when it comes to heat soak. So think about the fact that this card costing like 500 bucks more than a 3080 did, uh, it's like the cost of your CPU for the most part. It may not have been 500 bucks, it might have been two or 250, but still, any amount over, realistically, even just a Founders Edition card could be considered a waste of money. Because let's not forget, Nvidia, I don't, I don't know if AMD does this, but Nvidia, we know for a fact their Founders Edition cards are custom PCB, they are custom built cards. They, they are not the reference spec. The reference cards look entirely different than this. But so they have uh, good RAM modules in here. Typically they're running, I think, Samsung memory inside of the, the, NVIDIA, the NVIDIA cards and they're hand-picked GPUs because of the fact that they're building them for sale. So they have a pretty good bin and ASIC quality to them. So you can often find Founders Edition cards boost just as high as even the highest tiered custom AIB card out there. And they're always MSRP models. So look at how much money you can waste just on your graphics card. Now the last place that I think people tend to waste money is their storage. We're gonna take NVMEs as an example here. PCIe Gen 5 gives us a huge, huge uplift in performance in terms of data bandwidth and speed for storage. Now graphics cards right now are not really taking any sort of advantage of, of Gen 5. In fact, I think all the, the cards out right now still are technically Gen 4, but I could be wrong on that, but anyway you're not going to really notice any differences on Gen 5 or Gen 4 when it comes to graphics cards. On storage, like this T700 from Crucial runs over 11,000, yeah, 12,400 megabytes per second. In fact, we even did a, a video about this and got every bit of that performance. And I even like tried heating up the card or ran the card over and over and over and over and over and over and over, just nonstop going on, this, on the disk benchmark, like Crystal Disk and was not seeing any sort of reduction in performance because of the fact that the motherboard we had it on had a heatsink, so and it performed well. So PCIe Gen 4 is 5,000 megabytes per second. Now, of course, that is like large file. It's moving one file from one location to another. It's not having to seek and search and find files. That's where you're gonna get that speed. As soon as you start, like you're, you're never gonna see that sort of transfer rate as it's moving a lot of small files because it takes time. And then we have PCIe Gen 3, which if you look at Gen 3, now that, that seems really, really old. However, this is still 3,500 megabytes per second. You guys can go and look it up on your own time. The difference in price between this drive and this drive is significant. Now this is only a 500 gigabyte drive. Of course, this is a, what, one terabyte drive right here, I think? No, this is a two terabyte drive. You can find two terabyte Gen 3s and whatnot. In fact, it would be a heck of a lot cheaper than a, than a Gen 2 or a Gen 5 two terabyte. So let's just assume they were all the same capacity. 
you would also still, in a regular use case, using your computer, playing your game, surfing your internet, going to YouTube, doing whatever you do at night in your own time that I won't judge you for, you will never notice a difference between 3,500 and 12,400 but you certainly will notice a difference in the price. So you gotta really ask yourself, if you're not one of those professionals that is like constantly doing major, major file transfers and you're, you've got some sort of a NVMe NAS at home that you're constantly moving files around to, you would never notice the speed increase or difference. Even gaming, even games, don't take advantage of the load speed that a lot of these NVMEs are capable of doing. In fact, Phil was saying that Ratchet & Clank is the only game that, that supports direct storage. So everything else, believe it or not, when it comes to seeking a lot of the small files and stuff, you know, from wherever they're stored in the game file system, it's not going to get you anywhere near the advertised speeds. So having the 12,400 versus 3,500 is completely unnecessary. Now, if you're building a super badass system, you probably have all of these things that I've said are above and beyond what you need and a complete waste of money. Hell, my systems are perfect examples of that. Phil's system is an example of that. But the point is, if you're building on any sort of a budget, these are areas that you can easily save money. If you're building yourself an enthusiast PC, you don't care about this sort of stuff anyway. You just want to go with whatever fits, looks good, and, and ha you have li very little concern on what the cost is because you are just got a, a big enough budget to where it really doesn't impact it, then none of this is going to matter to you. But with the amount of people that are now starting to build PCs again, getting into their first PCs or upgrading a 10-year-old PC, this is the kind of stuff that can be overwhelming to them, trying to figure out what is the difference between a Gen 3 and a Gen 5 drive? What's, you know, what all, I've got this whole row of graphics cards and they all look the same. Like for instance, you got a 3060 Ti when it came out, they had a Strix model from Asus that was more expensive than the 3070. And the 3070, even the Founders Edition 3070 would stomp all over a 3060 Ti Strix. But it was more expensive because it said Strix and had a giant cooler on it, which was completely unnecessary because the thing ran like 51 degrees. So you can see how easy it is to waste money. And the brands are banking on the fact that you're not going to know the difference and you're just going to go with the higher priced one because it's going to mean it's better. So anyway, what are your number one, that's a complete waste of money, uh, to you, put it down in the comments. I have a feeling there's gonna be an overwhelming repeat of RGB down there. I think we can all agree on that one. But outside of RGB, what is your number one waste of money that you think everyone should just stop doing when it comes to building PC? Sound off down below, guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.